Okay, my name is Julie Pearson Littlefender. Today is Monday, March 13th, 2017, and I'm interviewing Aragon Starr for the Oklahoma Native Artists Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. We're here at the OSU Tulsa campus. Aragon, you're Kickapoo, Creek, Cherokee, and Seneca, and you excel at many things. You're a singer-songwriter with her own record company, as well as an actor and playwright. But I had no idea, really, of your graphic art skills until your first Super Indian comic book came out. Thank you for talking with me today. You're welcome. My <laughs> pleasure to be here. <laughs> Can you tell me first about your unusual name? Sure. My unusual name actually just came out of thin air one day. Um, my, my given name is Wapakami. It's tacked on the end, W A H. P-E-C-O-M-E. -E. That's my dad's name. He's Kickapoo. And going through school, I was like, oh, that name. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, nine letters of fun, fun, fun. And I, you know, I don't mean to make light of that name because it means white water. It has a meaning and mm. it's traditional. And that was the name of an ancestor that, you know, that was his whole name. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how things happen in Oklahoma with naming and Indians. And so th I, that name followed me around. It was tough because I grew up all over the country. And every two years, it was mm -hmm. a new experience of, ah, wah, bah, oh, bah, eh. you know, nobody could get that. So I yeah. just dropped it and I used Star. So Star is, you know, my middle name and that just kind of made sense. Now that name came from my mother. Mm -hmm. um, she was given that name by her kinfolk. Uh, the, the tradition was the youngest daughter got the name Star. So that star goes all the way back to uh, Tom Star and mm -hmm. Henry Star and Bell Star. So I've got a lot of outlo it's an outlaws. Outlaw blood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I got some ratty kinfolk and <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of rugged, but that's all right. <laughs> that's kind of that's where my stock comes from. <laughs> and how about Aragon? Well, that was, like I said, just wonderful. came out of the okay. air. That just was like I love this. Maybe I don't know more Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I may maybe because my mom read that book to me when I was a kid. Oh, yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so where were you born? I was born in Pensacola, Florida, very randomly, <laughs> as my dad was, you know, stationed in uh, the Navy, and that was where his uh, duty station was. So, you know, on, born on the road. <laughs> I feel like that song, you know, born in a trunk, you know, that's, that's, kind, of, that's kind of how it happened. And um, you grew up in these different places that mm -hmm. your dad was in. Yeah. Army yeah. Brad, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, what did your mom do for a living? Well, she got her degree at Oklahoma Baptist University in music, and um, she was also the secretary to the dean. So she had a lot of like office skills. She was smart and then had this musical education thing. So she sometimes worked as a teacher um, uh, of music at different schools, but she was also really instrumental, I think, um, in working with the government's Equal Opportunity Program. And she did a lot of that work back in the day to make sure that things are better for us ladies now. So um, she, that, she worked her entire career, and I think she got to like GS-13 or something, you know, when she finally retired. But she worked alongside, like where my dad was stationed, mm -hmm. she would work at the public works or work at the this that and the other office so yeah she's she always worked that's very cool how about brothers or sisters uh, I have one sister who since passed um, her name was Gay Gay Lynn and um, she just she was older than me and just was wonderful she's my best friend so I'm like, I miss her every day but her and I were just thick as thieves because of that moving situation. We, we just, we mm -hmm. kind of had to be friends because when you move to a new town and you don't know anybody, it's just like, well, what do we do? We get into trouble. <laughs> but yeah, she was great. We, we loved the same kind of music and books and TV shows and just, you know, all that kind of stuff we shared. And, um, you know, I, I, like I said, she passed away in 2010 and mm -hmm. I miss her. Mm -hmm. Um, how about your relationship with your grandparents on either side? 
Well, my dad's uh, folks passed away early. I think his parents were gone by the time he was 12. So I never did get to meet them. But my mom's parents lived here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And every chance we would get, wherever dad was stationed, he'd like get his time off. He'd get his week off. It's like, okay, we're getting in the car. And many times we would drive from the East Coast all the way to Oklahoma in the snow in a VW Bug. <laughs> or we would drive from San Diego or Gallup or wherever we were. And sometimes, you know, they would come out to visit us, and that was a lot of fun because they liked to travel as well. So um, they, they were wonderful people. Uh, David Cornell uh, was born down in Holdenville, and he was from that community. And my mother, Flora uh, Snow, was uh, Cherokee and Seneca. And the story was, well, her father was an, um, a Seneca that came out from New York to work in the oil fields. So that's how that all came to be together. And of course, she just, you know, they were just folks. And my, But my grandpa knew everybody in town. And I had this experience just last week when we went on a tour of Tulsa with the Historical Society, um, where we went over by Ziegler's Art Store. And I was like looking at the floor of this studio. There was an art studio right across the street. And I was like, this floor looks familiar. And the guy who was doing the tour said, now this used to be a TG and Y. And I said, I thought so because I remember Ziegler's and coming over here to this place and buying comic books. <laughs> so I mean, all wow. things are related because my grandpa would give us a buck and say, knock yourselves out. And he would talk to the people behind the counter and buy his cigars. And you know, then my sister and I would just get our Archies and Superman, Spider-Man, whatever, and then, you know, go back. And But yeah, I was like, that's, it's weird the things that you remember from when you were kids, like the floor. And you remembered the floor. That's yeah, because I know we sat there looking, reading the comic books that we didn't buy. <laughs> <laughs> so were you around Creek language? A yeah, little a little bit around Creek language. Uh, my grandpa spoke it fluently, um, but he had no inclination to teach my mother or me. We would just hear things and go, oh, humbucks chay, we know that. <laughs> That's the first thing you learn, <laughs> which means, you know, come and eat. <laughs> and um, do you think sometimes if you have these different backgrounds, then one influence will be a little more dominant than the other? Yeah, definitely. What was your experience? Well, my experience was definitely Creek culture more than Kickapoo culture because my dad was not exactly estranged, but he had one brother and his brother did not live in Oklahoma. He lived in Colorado Springs and other places. And um, that was it because his other sisters passed away and we did see them every once in a while, but my dad kind of remembered Kickapoo. And sometimes he would, we'd be sitting watching TV and he would just come up with some word and I was like, what is that? He said, that, that's kick-a-poo, and it means, you know, the one I always remember was like, anachi sa poi. And I was like, like you think, oh, great, deep meaning. He said, that means orange juice. <laughs> 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 and he would say, well, when I was a kid, we'd sit around and at the camp and around the fire in the little village down near Shawnee. The old women would sit around and make this black, thick, mud coffee. And when they were their cups were empty, they would just yell out, Kappa he And he said they would just add an a he to anything to make it kick food. <laughs> so our joke was always, you know, you all need some coffee, let's stop at Starbucky. <laughs> so that's what we do now, Starbucky. <laughs> that's great. Oh. Um, so there was probably quite a bit of music in the household. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Music came mainly from my mom because she loved, I mean, she's very religious. She's she's Southern Baptist, so, and she was raised, her grandfather was a preacher and her dad was a deacon, so they were deep into that life. And, in fact, my mom and dad met at a, a church in Shawnee, set up by my, my Sack and Fox uncle. So, <laughs> so that's how that goes. Um, she loved um, classical music, and she loved show tunes. So the, this tradition was every Sunday morning, everybody gets to pick a record, you know, and they had one of those old platter things where, you know, you could load up four discs and, you know, one would play, and then the next one would come. And Okay, so it was either classical, 
show tunes, Frank Sinatra, Bob Wills, and then if we could sneak in a Beatles, we'd do it. <laughs> <laughs> they, oh my God, my sister and I love the Beatles. Um, but yeah, we would hear Hank Thompson, Bob Wills, you know, all those, Charlie Pride, that kind of music with the classical, with the show tunes, with Frank Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald. <laughs> and I can sort of hear some of those threads, I mean, yeah. in your mm. music. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> How about um, visual art? What was your first experience maybe of seeing Native art? Well, I go back to my Aunt Susie Alford's house. Um, I, and I'm not sure which artists they have on their wall, but it was always those kind of, uh, that flat stylized art from like AC Blue Eagle and Drum Tiger. Fred Beaver, that kind of stuff. That's what I remember seeing. And I was like, oh, that is really cool. You know, that kind of looks like comic books because of the way that they would draw with the outline and, and the flat color. I was like, oh, that, and that always caught my eye, you know. And, of course, everybody, like, had ended the trail or something, well, you know, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> the Indian prayer, you know. <laughs> that, that kind of artwork. But... Yeah, I just I love that AC Blue Eagle and Woody Crumbo. Mm -hmm. That oh, that just makes me happy. <laughs> what is your first memory of making art? Oh gosh, I, I would think it was probably back in kindergarten. I was, you know, I was always drawing from when I was a young kid. You know, the, you sat down in school, it's like, oh yeah, let me get, let me get on that. And I would win art contests back, you know, when I was just a little kid. They were like, oh, this is really great, whoa, you know. And I, I won art contests as I went along because my parents just really believed in that. And mm -hmm. um, my grandpa was an artist. Uh, my uncle on my dad's side, my uncle Rudolph, was an architect. And um, there were all these skills, mm -hmm. music and art, but art, you know, I was like, well, yeah, if you want to draw, okay, you want to paint, okay, we'll get you paints. You know, so that's, they were supportive, and they would, they, they supported my habits, eh? <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. And then, then one of them you mentioned in an interview, I think, previously, was you love to draw cartoons. Yes, always cartoons. Or and, comics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I loved an anything animation, of course, Disney and then Saturday morning cartoons and all that. But I was, I adamantly read that comic page every Sunday. The daily, I mean, we got newspapers back then, so we were like, yeah, look at this. Oh, how did they do that? Oh, you know, so I, I just copied. You know, I got my tracing paper and just, you know, put it over the Spider-Man comic book and said, okay, that's how they're doing that, okay. Of course, you know, I, I, if I'd been smart, I probably would have gone to school and did figure study and all that stuff, but I didn't do it. I just copied. You taught, you, that you taught yeah. yourself that mm -hmm. way. <clears throat> so what, how about some of the places that you went to school that might be connected with memories of doing art as well? Um, well, let's see. I'm trying to think. Most of my my big art training came in San Diego when my dad got stationed. Uh, he was on board a ship, so he was usually gone mm -hmm. like six months, eight months out of the year. And they put us up in Navy housing and this new section right on this big hill. And we had to ride a bus at least a half hour, 45 minutes to school every morning. But in those classes, I took a cartooning class. Um, I was learning how to paint. I had learned how to paint. Actually, I started painting when we were stationed in the Philippines because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> so I had kind of, a great experience there. Uh, oh, gosh, yeah, that was fun. And that's kind of where my love of theater started because that was there was a, a theater teacher there who said, I like how you read. Why don't, you know, they did school plays. Mm -hmm. So I did, you know, I did school plays, and that was where I had my first band. And you were yeah. what age? Oh, let's yeah. see, how old was I there? Uh, 12, 13? Yeah, just just a preteen, teenage kid. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that art, everything was all going throughout mm -hmm. this singing mm -hmm. and writing and drawing, and it, it, it all was going on. There was no, like, I'm going to do this now. I don't know. They always do it. It was all in a row. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the visual art in San Diego, that was, you were what age um, when you started taking those? 16. Okay. Yeah, 17. Mm -hmm. And it was extracurricular outside yes, of school. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
What did you do after high school? I tried to figure out how I was going to make enough money to buy a guitar. <laughs> Because I had decided... Did you, did you play piano at that yeah, point? Yeah, oh yeah, okay. yeah. I, I played piano and guitar and okay. bass guitar. And my mother had decided, because I love the Beatles, you know, the first electronic instrument I had was a bass guitar. She said, it's because you like Paul McCartney. And I'm like, I wanted to play the guitar. So, but you know what? That came in handy because everybody always needs a bass player. <laughs> it's it's like learning how to type. It's like, can you be make yourself useful? Yeah, I can. Four, four strings, I can do this. I'm lo locking in with a drummer, you know? <laughs> so I, st I actually still have that guitar. So you performed in a few bands? Yes! High school yeah. bands oh gosh, something. yeah, uh huh. Yeah, I was, all, I mean, okay, let, yeah, let's, let's do cover tunes. I mean, it's a great way to learn and to see if you even like it right. or like if you fit in with people and all that and can work with people. That's, that's Those are good skills to have. <laughs> <laughs> so you, so you, worked to, to get a guitar? Is that yes, I did, because I, I had thought to myself, and here's like the sad state of, you know, education back then, be, and funding, and it's not so much the sad state mm -hmm. of education, but the funding to get there. Um, I, I had my eyes set on going to the Parsons School of Design in New York City. I don't, I'm not even sure how I knew about it, but I thought, that's the place for me. I need to go do that because I'd love to. Did they have comic book illustrations? I'm sure they did. I'm, that's probably how I found, I found out about it. So I went to my mom and dad. I said, well, this is what I want to do. Well, we looked at how much it cost, and we're like, oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And to you know afford to live there and go to school. And so they said, okay, well, we'll call our tribe, and we'll call the BIA. We'll do all that. And they got nowhere. They got absolutely nowhere, and um, in fact, when they talked to San Diego, California, they were like, "You, we can't help you. You, I know we know you live here, but you're not from here, so you got to call Oklahoma." And they called Oklahoma and said, "Well, you all live out there, so we can't really help you." And it was so my dreams of higher education were dashed at that point. I was in a hurry. I had things to do, so I said, "Mom, can you help me get a government job so I can at least, you know." have some scratch to get my guitar and she's like yeah okay so her thing had always been learn how to type learn how to if you can learn how to do shorthand learn to be that front office person and so I that's what I did I got a job with the government and that's what I did okay. and I worked in the government for about three years and I was able to get a transfer up to Long Beach, which my step towards Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> you had your plan. <laughs> I had my plan. I had my plan. So that's how it happened. And if I hadn't learned how to type, I, I don't, you know, I'm telling you, there's just these basic things <laughs> that kids don't know. It's just, like, learn how to type, man. Right. <laughs> learn how to type fast. Right. That has always gotten me somewhere. I mean, even more than just being artistic or whatever, but because I knew how to type and kind of how to take shorthand, I took a test like over the phone with this uh, personnel person in Hollywood who was placing people with film studios, with production companies, with record companies. Because if you had these skills, they mm -hmm. wanted you. They were like, they always need extra hands. So I took a I, and she said, okay, I'm going to talk fast, and you write it down, and then read it back to me. And I said, blah, 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 blah. And I read it back to her, and she's like, I can get you a job tomorrow. And I was like, what? So yeah, I, I was working at a hotel in Universal City, the Sheraton Universal, um, in catering, and I took this test over the phone, and I got that job, and I was sitting at my desk at the hotel, and I'm like, oh, well, that didn't work out. And she, she called me, and she said, um, do you know what time it is? I said, yeah, I'm at my job. She said, well, you have another job at Paramount. They're expecting you. You need to get over there. And I'm like, And Whoa. how exciting for somebody who was wanting to break into the mm -hmm. show business. Yeah, so I went into my hotel boss and I said, I'm leaving. Bye-bye. <laughs> and that was that. And I, like, left, left off the cliff and was working at Paramount Pictures. <laughs> So what year was this when you got the Paramount? Game? 1985. <laughs>
<laughs> just a yang thing. Yeah, and just moving a, along. Yeah, just yeah. I, I just I, you know, and that led to other gigs. That led to working at Viacom Productions as a legal secretary because I could type fast. Did they and know that you could sing and you could no write? And you could... idea. Not a clue. So what had to happen was I go to work, I do my nine to six, and then I would eat dinner, rest, and then go to the coffee house and wait to get on the open mic. Wow. Which sometimes was till one in the morning and there were two people there. But that's okay. I'm uh -huh. like, I got on stage. I did my songs. That's how I, I was writing music then and doing all this other stuff and then meeting people in the interim and just, you know. And then I through that, I hooked up with um, the American Indian Registry for Performing Arts because I knew that there were other natives in town and I was like, I'm feeling kind of adrift up here because I wouldn't always drive down to San Diego. Back then you could really make it in two hours. It was easy to do. Not so much now, but um, yeah. So I was like, oh, what should I do? And th so I hooked up with these people, and their whole goal in life, and this was set up by Will Sampson back in the early 80s, to have a place where casting directors could come find headshots and resumes. They could h hold workshops for people and that sort of thing. And um, they would have dinners and gatherings and showcases, and that's where I met Bob Hicks and Harrison Lowe, and uh, Sherry Foster, Salina Jane, all these people that are from back here, I met out there. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, so working with them, and then that, that organization kind of ended, and then it became First Americans in the Arts. So then I worked with Don Jackson, and uh, Brian Westcott, and gosh, Valerie Redhorse, and all these other people that were you know, we, we put on an award show. We also always used to say, it's the Emmys, Oscars, Grammys in one night for natives. <laughs> right. You know, and that, okay, so as I was, I was still doing coffee houses, still working, and then I, I did a seminar at USC, no, 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 UCLA that was called Publicity. And it was, it was this woman named Bryn Breidenthal who was the uh, publicist at Geffen Records. And before that, she'd worked at Electra Records. And, I knew of her because she worked for Queen. I mean, she Queen was one of the big bands that she used to work, and I was always heard her name, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. So I went to her class, just kind of like, kind of being a fan girl, like, oh, she talking about Queen. <laughs> yeah. But then I found out I really kind of like dug the whole publicity thing. So I I told her I said, I, this this is neat. How do I get into this? And then she's like, well. Talk to this person, talk to that person, and I took another class at USC. And again, these were the adult education, mm -hmm. you know, elective kind of things that, that they have for professionals after hours, you know, on the campus. So I met another guy, Bender Goldman and Helper, another dude, who said, I know a person that's looking for somebody. You'd be perfect. Go talk to this guy named Ramon Hervey. And Ramon was married at that time to Vanessa Williams, and this was just after the Miss America scandal. <laughs> so he was working with this company called Alive Productions, and our big client were Alice Cooper, Luther Vandross, <laughs> and some other various and sundry. But um, he, he interviewed me, and um, I, got, I got a job. So I left my legal secretary behind and went to the music business. And that, that didn't last, sadly. I mean, I was sorry that we didn't, our contract didn't get extended, but I got to work with a lot of, I mean, the, oh, what was the name of the guy that used to do Soul Train? Don, oh, I can't remember his name, but he used to call it that Soul Train oh, voice, wow. you know? So, and there were <laughs> things like Black Radio Exclusive and, mm -hmm. To work in the African American community and the R and B community, I was right. like, "Oh my god, <laughs> that was really cool." That and you know, I did get to meet Alice Cooper and Luther Vandross. And, I was like, and in the meantime, you're getting this great PR background because yes. the, it's a big portion mm -hmm. of any artist's life, and yet yeah. it's probably the hardest thing people learn. Exactly, you know, how to do interviews, how to approach the press, how to write a press release, a bio, and all that jazz. So yeah, I mean, I, the education that I got working at Viacom, because 
Okay, so the next step after Ramon Hervey is I got hired as a publicist at the company I was working at before, at Viacom, because they knew me mm -hmm. as a legal secretary, but they just hired in-house publicity. And I said, hey, we know you. Come back. Wow. So I did, and that's where I got to go on set and work with, uh, let's see, at that time we were doing Matlock, Perry Mason, Jake and the Fat Man, all these kind of like CBS kind of shows. But it was taking a script because my boss said that you need to learn how to do this. Read that script, write me a one paragraph breakdown of it and write a log line that, like you'd read in TV Guide. And so I got real good at that yes. because there were 23 epi 24 episodes in each season for each of these programs. So read, 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 write, 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 read, 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 write, write, write. And um, yeah. And I, and, and I was just seeing something over the weekend about that. reading yeah. these scripts Oops. that are not exactly plays, but nonetheless, there's that writing for... The writing format, writing for television. You know, no, it's this many pages. Here mm -hmm. are the natural breaks. You know, just, yeah. You know, and read to learning on the job every day. Mm -hmm. You know, and then after that job finished, because that's what happens in Hollywood, everything's cyclical, and they kick people out. So there I was going, what am I going to do now? Well, downstairs, the floor downstairs, there's another guy hiring publicity. And so I ended up at Showtime. So I worked at Showtime Networks for quite a few Which years. Which was kind of new then, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's when they were they were <clears throat> still the the ugly cousin of mm -hmm. HBO, just in the shadows. Not really. Well, finally, they, they had some series that were kind of like people start, oh, they gave Tom Hanks his first job as a director. And I remember working on that show, and we had to use, do this uh, convention twice a year called the Tel Television Critics of America, TCA would come in January and July, and you would have, they called them the upfronts. I don't know if you've heard this lingo, but they would bring the cast and the producers to this, like a big hotel, put them on a stage in front of the press, and they'd talk about, well, well so this season on Mount Lock or whatever, whatever show it was, you know, uh, this thing that we did was called Fallen Angels, and it was a film noir only revisited with all of these amazing directors, including Tom Hanks. Because um, I always mention Tom because he gave me a hard time. Only because he was being super nice and trying to help us save a dollar. And while they, it made me crazy because they always used to say, make sure the talent gets in the limo so we know where they are exactly at every <laughs> moment. And this was in the days right before cell phones came in. Uh -huh. So we always oh. were like sweating it. Like, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And then somebody told me, he decided to drive himself. And I'm like, no, no. And <laughs> <laughs> that and may be material. Indeed. And, and then he came in at the last minute all, hey, sorry, I'm late. And I was, pull over there, pull over there. <laughs> <laughs> but he was sweet as could be. And he was just trying to save us a dime, <laughs> you know, not be Hollywood. But from our perspective, it was like, please get in the limo. Please get in the limo. <laughs> But that's what I that's what I did at Showtime, which was different than the publicity I did at Viacom, which was I set up screenings, mm -hmm. I invited press, I pitched press, and had to handle talent. So it was like on a daily basis, you know, right, people like right. Forrest Whitaker and just all these, you know, and still doing my stuff on the side. <laughs> I was going to say, so what was your first kind of big break into doing your own music? It was my friend Dawn Jackson from First Americans in the Arts because she worked at Disney and she knew that I was an artist. She said, hey, I have a job for you if you can handle it. And I said, what is it? She said, well, I'm managing all of the artwork um, submissions for the Disney stores. And what I would need you to do is, and I'll send you all the specs about how to draw these characters, I just need you to do something imaginative with a pocket on a shirt or a t-shirt. Put Winnie the Pooh, put Dalmatians, put whatever on the shirt. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and she said, you can just fax your work in. You don't, have to, you, you don't have to come to an office. It's freelance. I said, oh, okay. And so I got these big books of specs for Lion King and did, you know, all those Dalmatians. I got a lot of work on Dalmatians. Oh my God, those little puppies. So um, wow. I 
would fax my work in and I was she's like you you're good keep them coming and she said I'll pay you $75 a character so if you want to put two three four characters that's $75 each I'm like what what the best money you've made so far yes so I was able to to I had this meeting with my my boss at Showtime my two bosses who I love dearly and who loved me and wanted to see me advance they said well, we're thinking about making you a publicist. Are, are you ready to take that next step? And I said, nope. Mm-hmm. And I was shocked, and they were shocked. But I And I was kind of like, I'm really shooting myself in the foot here. But I knew I had another gig that I could go to and another dream that I had that wasn't about Tom Hanks and his mm-hmm. limo. <laughs> Right. So I I told my boss, no, I've got a freelance gig, and I'm going to leave. And I'm just... uh, 1996, I left my corporate job with all the bennies and the things and everything and said, I'm going to work for Disney. Freelance. (laughs) And so I did. And in that year, I faxed in so much work that was accepted and put in production that I had enough money to make a not only to live but to make a CD, and that's how I would. That's how I became an artist, a for real artist. That's <laughs> that was my big breakthrough. Work doing T-shirt design for Walt Disney. <laughs> well, I love that you called your music. You call your music production company Wacky Productions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> how did you? come up with that? Was it the Disney it, connection? It, it, and it was just everything, because that's my life, you know, that everything that has happened, it's just It's all like, perfectly it's all like, makes <laughs> sense, but, yes. yeah. but it's very wacky, because people were like, what are you doing now? And I'm like, well, and they were like, that's just so bizarre, you know, I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, my whole life feels like it's bizarre like that, but, you know. In terms of your music and the CDs, because you have four of them yes. now, um, what was the progression of them? Were they, was it sort of a thematic one? I know one involves your one woman show, right? Red Road. But um, the first CD and part of the second one were already just material that I had written over the years. Okay, that you've been doing mm-hmm. in the coffee houses. Yes, exactly. So I, it was it was just really great to flesh it out with a full band with drums and bass and you know because I think when people see me now they think oh she's just this little acoustic guitar singer you know but then the music on the CDs isn't like that. My manager Janet Miner told me a funny story we did this show at Agua Caliente which is this big casino out in Palm Springs so we performed and then there was this little lady came up at the end she asked Janet she said which one of these is really good for massage? (laughs) Because <laughs> I, I was like, did you not just see us on stage? She's like, here, take this one. You know, and we were like, I wonder how that went. <laughs> <laughs> no idea. It's not your native flute. No, it's, it's not easy. a flutey tutor kind of, <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, funny, funny. Um, well, did you, I assume you did yarn design work, sort of, for... Actually, no, I farmed okay. it out, because back at that time, in the late 90s, uh, people were still, it was still pen on paper, it mm-hmm. was film, It so I actually hired a designer to do that, because she was doing record design for Warner Brothers, so I figured, she knows how to make that film, so they go to the printer, and it's all... Right. All good. Right. Yeah, and it actually wasn't until the third CD that I actually, I painted the cover for that, and I painted okay. the inside flat, but that's, I still gave it to the designer to make it right. Right. For the printer, because that's, that's a whole other skill set. Well, let's talk about your uh, one-woman musical a little bit, The Red okay. Road. Um, I understand that you were working on this piece. Well, first tell us a bit about it, and then uh, I understand you went to a Comic-Con convention while you were working on it, so you can tell us about both. Yeah, okay, so The Red Road came from my manager, Janet Miner, and uh, Randy Reinholtz and Jean Bruce Scott from Native Voices, kind of sitting there thinking, you know, Erin's a really good actor. We really like her work. Um, 
but we've seen her sing and we love her singing and how do we bring all this stuff together and Janet Miner having seen all of this growth come because she's the business partner in Wacky Productions she said okay here's what I think Aragon should do she should write a one person show so she can act and sing in it and that's really Oh, it was. Yeah, that's how it came about. It was just kind of like, how do we put all these talents together to present this picture that, you know, people at the Autry said, oh, you're just such a wonderful actor. I said, but I sing too, you know? (laughs) So, because they had no knowledge of all of like, yeah, I toured England. Yeah, I've been uh, X, Y, and Z. I've been to you know, Washington, D.C. to sing, and I've been down here, and it's like, Mm -hmm. they didn't know anything about that. So it was like, okay, okay, let's let's do this. So I'd written the show, art show, I mean, the song called The Red Road, because a friend in Nashville had said, would you write a song about a native truck driver? And I said, okay. (laughs) (laughs) And it's funny, I never did give that song to him, but um, I thought, what a concept. Because I having been... Because it led to all of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just came from the experience of being on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, I was on the road all the time. I was always in my car going to the next gig with the band, sometimes without the band. (laughs) So I had that life, too. Uh And um, so I took that idea and just kind of started to flesh it out. And I said, well, where would this happen? And I said, well, you know, they always say, write what you know. And I thought, ooh, Oklahoma. (laughs) 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 So, you know, Sepulpa, Mm -hmm. Route 66, (laughs) all that kind of stuff just came, came to mind as something to talk about. And I had thought... You know, growing up in, growing, I, I feel like I grew up in Los Angeles because I've been there so long. But b- spending time there, I got to know a lot of the people that were in the American Indian movement. And when I was a kid, my kinfolk here had always said, you stay away from those Amers. They're just bad people. They're just, oh. And I was like, okay. You know, but then I would go to things and I would mm-hmm. start to meet these people. Um, Fern Mathias, who was the director of Southern California, AIM back then she was really nice and she taught me things about Indians that I did not know anything about Mm -hmm. and I feel like you know she was one of my tutors so was Charlie Hill Mm -hmm. and uh, Floyd Westerman Mm -hmm. and all these people that were in that and there was like I need to talk about this I just I want to tell the story of a kid seeing AIM and some some of the ridiculousness of it because you know of course the guy in Red Road is just a buffoon, <laughs> but some of them they, no, <laughs> we're not naming names, but <laughs> that the way that people see that and I thought so the show is set in the 1970s because that's when I was kind of growing up as I was just blinders on a lot I just I just know Star Trek mm-hmm. I just know the Beatles I just you know I'm in this not realizing there's all this other stuff going on Mm -hmm. in the world. And, of course, the country music was like a tribute to my dad and the music that he listened to. And um, my mother was the one who was the science fiction. (laughs) (laughs) Putting that on her. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. So that's how this show kind of just evolved into 11 characters Mm -hmm. one actor all these different songs and you know and I love English music I told you I like Queen but I also like you know like The Clash and all these other like (laughs) punk rock was really big when I was kind of growing up too so I was like I gotta incorporate all that and (laughs) I always did the voices that was one thing I did constantly as a child when I would write these scripts and I would record them on my cassette recorder. I would do all the voices, man. You know, and that's how okay. how like British thing came. Because I used to like Monty Python. You know, so that's I always listening. You always had always that listening talent. For... Yeah, yeah, always listening. <laughs> well, while you were working on that, then you heard about this Comic Con convention in San Diego yes. and decided to check it out. Yeah, um, I actually knew about that comic convention from the first time my dad was stationed when we were living in San Diego. The San Diego Comic Con started in the basement of the El Cortez Hotel in downtown San Diego. 
and I think it was, I'm going to say 74, mm -hmm. because um, I heard about it on the news, and I saw it in the newspaper, and I said, Mom, can we go to Comic-Con? And she's like, well, I have something else to do on Saturday, but here's what I'll do. Here, here's some money to go in. You stay there for a couple of hours, and then at the appointed time, you come out. This is how she always did with us. She she would drop us off at the sports arena for some concert. Now you come out by ten o'clock, and oftentimes the band had just gone on. <laughs> anyway, but um, so I went to that Comic Con I, the first time when I was I would say it was like ten. Wow, eleven. Okay. I was just a little bit, but the boxes, the the e, and I was like, oh, look at all this. So. I went back when I was, we were rehearsing the Red Road at San Diego State because um, Randy is an instructor down there. He's a professor. So we were using their black box to kind of work it out and cut and paste. So it was during July when the Comic-Con was on and this was 2005. Yeah, I'm going to say it's 2005. Comic-Con was big in San Diego. It was a lot bigger than the basement of the mm -hmm. Cortez. They were in the convention center. Mm -hmm. But then you could walk up and buy a ticket. You can't do that now. It's too popular. So I had a free Saturday. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go down there and see what it's like. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, because it, it's like ballrooms right. of, you know, people talking about TV. It was and more genre, television, film. It was more than just comic books. Mm -hmm. And then downstairs, there was this humongous exhibit hall just full of, you know, here the studios come present. Now, HBO, CW, War I mean, all, and then, of course, Marvel DC, Image, Dark Horse, everybody had a booth, and they were promoting their latest projects, and mm -hmm. the actors were there. And I always say the first panel that I saw at Comic-Con was Grant Morrison, who's a, an amazing comic book writer, and Deepak Chopra were talking about the zen of comic heroes. And what I was like, what in the world? I was like, oh, you can do that in comics? It's not just, you know, bing, bang, bing. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I just kind of stored that away while I was doing Red Road. <laughs> <laughs> So I was wondering how long that percolated before you came up with the idea for the radio series, Super it, Indian. Yeah, it, it, was, it, it didn't percolate long, only because um, I think that same year we had done a, um, a retreat for Native theater artists uh, to Brisbane, Australia. It was an international thing. It was kind of a collaboration between us and, and uh, the Aboriginal uh, folks. So I was on this train with Randy and Jean and Drew Hayden Taylor, <laughs> of all people. He's so silly. <laughs> so we were just sitting there being silly with each other, and I was drawing, and I said, you know, I, I really want to do a comic book with a superhero, because there's not enough Indian superheroes. And he was like, yeah, 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 and maybe you should do this, and maybe you should do that. And I was like, yeah, super Indian, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I kept those sketches, and I just like, well, whatever. Um, Native Voices then got a contract or got some money, I think, from Ford Foundation to do radio theater. And that's how it came to be. Okay. They put the call out for script submissions. They said, we're going to do the West, uh, in West Plains, Missouri, the National Audio Theater Festival has invited a bunch of Native artists to come present a, a couple of Native scripts. So I wrote Super Indian as a 10-minute episode. And they said, yeah, yeah, we, let's do this. It's fun. It's, it's like the old Batman TV series. I said, yeah, that's what I want. It's got to be funny. It's got to be funny. Right. <laughs> yeah, and it's the perfect venue for, like, flights of fantasy and things that you could never pull off on stage, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So how did it lay the groundwork for your comic book? Well, because I did those, that pilot script, um, and they liked it so much, they said, let's do 10 five-minute episodes. And I was like, oh, because I had imagined they were going to air every week and it was going to be this long thing. But yeah. what ended up happening is we taped, them, we taped all the episodes at the Wells Fargo Theater in Los Angeles with a, uh, live actors, live musicians, live sound effects, and they packaged it all into a one-hour show. And I was like, oh, oh. I wish I, that would have changed my narrative Yes. Because it could have been a, a, a more cohesive story. Instead, I attacked it as 
10 episodes. Right. But you know what? That was okay because I had those 10 scripts and those became the comic book. Okay. And there were six others that were commissioned but never taped mm -hmm. that I was like, these are never going to, nobody's ever going to find out about Mr. Buddy and, and Blood <laughs> Quantum, the vampire. And <laughs> I, w I was heartbroken that they, it didn't get picked up, but I was like, well, what am I going to do with this? I said, well, okay, well, learn how to do a comic book. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, well, I was wondering if you even found yourself for the radio play, because it, it is different, kind of thinking in terms of storyboarding or thinking graphically a mm -hmm. little bit while you're yeah. writing. Yes. Yeah, and it actually did help because I was such a fan of comic books that I knew the structure mm -hmm. and what people expected to see mm -hmm. with their minds. It's like, okay, and the explosion, and the, yeah. And I had really good tutors on my um, radio series to think audi audibly. Mm -hmm. And that that is, a whole, again, a whole other skill set of like, okay, don't forget to say who's talking to whom. And then when this is happening, and, you know, I'm like, I never thought about that. Right. I never thought. So that was William DeFree, um, again, great great producer, great director, um, also known as the voice of Bob the Builder <laughs> on PBS. Um, but he also knew a friend of a friend who was kind of like, and again, all these th weird things that cycle together. Remember I was telling you about Queen? So Brian May, who was the guitar player for Queen, um, knew a friend of mine named Melanie. She worked for him. And Melanie came to me once and said, Brian May wants to talk about Indian stuff. And I'm like, what? <laughs> now you're the only person I know that knows about Indian stuff. So we, I had this long meeting with Brian May and his friend Dirk Maggs. Now, you and Brian May is like, whoa! rock and roll god and I was like this is my goes, I rock queen and rock but I'm sitting here talking about okay so um, let's talk about sacred sites and let's talk about you know I mean mm -hmm. it was weird to be that representative and I was mm -hmm. like thank god I knew Fern and Charlie mm -hmm. and all those people so mm -hmm. I could speak like a reasonable person and not just mm -hmm. be all I don't I don't know quite what he was expecting, but mm -hmm. he was we both were still friends, so it's all good. Um, but Dirk Maggs is a and still is an audio theater producer for the British Broadcasting Corporation. And one of his good friends was like Douglas Adams and he knows Neil Gaiman and he's done all these shows, including an audio version of Spider Man that starred William DeFree as Peter Parker. Wow. So all these people knew each other, mm -hmm. and that's how I got hooked up with Dirk Maggs. And Dirk was my other um, tutor because Dirk did a radio version of Red Road, and we had to rethink it as the one person show, but right. as wow, you do it on the radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, that was really fascinating, and I, I hope that we get to do another project together, and I'm sure that we will. Well, um, tell us just a little bit about your superhero. Um, Hubert. Your, yes, Hubert. Just yes. The, a little bit of the premise and then... Um. Okay, so here. Okay, reaching back into the Viacom days and the <laughs> script and the log line, a reservation boy eats tainted commodity cheese and gains superpowers. Boom! That's it. I love it. <laughs> and um, Hubert ate cheese with resium. In them, it was a secret government experiment <laughs> by Dr. Eaton Crow. <laughs> and um, he develops these powers. He flies, he's super strong, he does all kind of Superman y kind Very of things. Very looking. And uh, uh, just, yeah. But, you know, working as a janitor in the bingo hall by day. <laughs> With his sidekick, General Bear, aka Mega Bear, and his super intelligent talking dog, DOG. <laughs> <laughs> who also ate the cheese and has his own super intellect because of that. You know, you've and you have a lot of strong women characters always and yes. always have had in your work. But so I was kind of curious why you chose a young male as opposed to a female a, a protagonist. A female protagonist, yeah. I I actually wanted to hook in like the little kids the they, I know that the, the boys don't have 
their person mm. and I wanted them to have their person because mm -hmm. I knew when you write something like this in a comic book style you can add as many characters as you want right. and bring them on in a way that makes sense so in volume two I addressed that whole issue of the native female superhero which was Laguna Woman mm -hmm. and again through a good friend Lee Francis the fourth um, you know, I said, hey, can I borrow your last name and your tribe? It's like, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and because of my many travels, I had met this lady named Shaye Lucero, who was one of the former Miss Indian Worlds, who was from Laguna Pueblo. And I said, I need to pick your brains. This has to be right. Mm -hmm. So I went to her about, you know, her, her regalia and mm -hmm. what she should look like. And, you know, what, what can I take from your culture that's, for everybody that's right. not going to cross any lines. Right. So we worked on her outfit and got her right, and and she became a cat. She saved Super Indian. Right. You know, from Blood Quantum, the <laughs> vampire that's cursed to become a full blood Indian because <laughs> he stole some Aztec gold. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, yeah, Indian humor is such a big part of your work. Um, what other messages are you focused on with your comic books? Well, I, I think it's, yeah, it's the humor, but it's also the contemporary, mm -hmm. because, um, yeah, I could have gone back and done, you know, leather and feathers and teepees and all that, but I'll leave that to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So there's others that are out there that's doing so. You all go at that. Because uh, I just think that people, that's all they think or see of us, mm -hmm. you know, and if we're not contemporary then oh well yeah see you later mm -hmm. so that's that's why it's this contemporary setting right. and they are they're on the internet they have cell phones they do all of that stuff so but all those layers are there too mm -hmm. all those historical layers and yes. all those do you think of your audience as primarily native or who are you interested in reaching well when i wrote it i was writing it for writing a for native audience because again we don't have these things and I thought it's wrong that we don't have these things and I need to fix that and my sort of my artwork style has been based on the X-Men of the 1980s because mm -hmm. I had thought in the back of my mind what if this this was a comic book that had been done in the 80s or had been always been around but had just been discovered and I thought, oh, okay, well then that answers my artwork question as to how I'm going to make it look. Okay. So I went back and bought a bunch of X-Men compendiums because that's one of my favorite books. Because again, that's about the weird, the outsiders, mm -hmm. the how do we fit into society. And I, I feel a real kinship with that book mm -hmm. and those characters because it's like, that's how I feel. And I know that's how a lot of people feel. And that's certainly how Native and people before, feel. Right. <laughs> and before X-Men, the movie, got so popular. Exactly, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so I, I went back to John Byrne and, um, what's his name, John Romita, and these other artists that were doing this kind of heavy line style. Um, it, Jack Kirby, Joe Kubert, all these comic book people. There's this, like, this, there's this kind of oh, action style. So I said, I'm going to do it like that. But make them look really Indian, you know right. what I mean? They just, but they look like my cousins or my aunties or, you know, people that I know, right. you know? And I, I just thought that that was important to bring that. So it looks like it has always been, and it's not just this certain kind of style. It's just like, no, 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 it's like right. classic. <laughs> you, you can really see that there. Um, why are comic books such a good medium for Native storytelling? I think because pictures and words together are a, a little less threatening than just a printed page or just an image because it's like I'm I'm gonna guide you through this. I'm gonna guide but you can put your own sound effects in there and you can read it at your pace or linger on a panel if you want to or just read through it and then go back. It's I mean it's up to the reader, but I really think that um, uh, native artists we've done that forever. It's always been pictures on rocks, on walls, mm -hmm. on so that we have this tradition of comics, mm -hmm. um, but they just hadn't been called that. <laughs> right, right. Um, so you were used to touring with music, and you were used to touring with plays, but now all of a sudden you're doing book tours. 
Oh my so gosh. So what are those like? How is that different? It's so different <clears throat> in that I, I kind of, I can it, it, it's akin to doing powwows because you take all your stuff and you sit at a booth all day. <laughs> Or an art show. It's the same deal. Right, you know, you right, just have right, your right. stuff and you sit there and, you know, people either look at your stuff and go, huh. Or they say, I want that, you know. That's yeah, one <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the other component of um, Comic Cons and that sort of thing is doing panels. And that's really fun because you get to talk to your audience and you also get to talk to people that are like, hey, a native comic, wonder what that's about. Mm -hmm. Or, I like Indians, I'm going to go check that out. And ask stupid questions. But no, 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 you know, no, no stupid questions. No stupid questions. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's good to be out there to be able to talk about right. the work and inform and include. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did it mean to you when you got then your work picked up in this anthology of Native Comics, Moonshot? Oh, that was, you know what's interesting about that? Um, and I'll just, I, I, because I talked to Jay Ojik about this, and he's the creator of Kagagi the Raven up in Canada. We both had this discussion at Indigenous Comic Con. We looked at each other as so we were on the same panel talking, and I said, can we talk about Moonshot? And he's like, yeah, we can talk about Moonshot. <laughs> I said, well, okay, here's my deal. Um, the, the editor and the publisher are not Native. Mm -hmm. And they had a certain concept of what Native should be. And I don't know if you've seen Moonshot. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful book. It's beautiful. The artwork in it. Some of the stories are kind of rambling, kind of whatever. But I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. I came into Moonshot as a writer. Um, I asked very nicely, could I illustrate it as well? And I said, oh, no, no, we have somebody. I'm like, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know the origins of this person, and mm -hmm. I think that he's claiming to be Métis. Mm -hmm. Don't know if that's real or not. I don't know. The artwork is nice. I mean, it's nice. I'm not, he did a good job, but I just, you know, I was like, okay. So Moonshot is a creek story about... Um, the water master snake and basically it's like don't pick up stuff off the ground and eat it because you might I don't know something bad would happen so, <laughs> and in this case the kid finds a can of spam and has heard it's a delicacy and he eats it and becomes a snake ah! <laughs> see told you <laughs> um, and Jay had okay so we're back to this conversation at Indigenous Comic Con and um I said, so the same people came back and said, we're doing volume two, and we'd love to have you involved. Mm -hmm. we, Watermaster story was real key. Everyone really loved that one. So can you write us another one? And I said, I'd love to write you another one. Can I draw it this time? And they said, oh, no, 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 we have somebody. Mm -hmm. I'm like, mm, no. Mm -hmm. And Jay Ojik had the same experience where they said, um, we can't, we don't want you to write that story like that. And they were kind of dictating how he was to tell a native traditional story. And he said, oh, I'm back in a way, I'm back in a way. So no, I mean, there's there's other artists that I know that are working on volume two. And mm -hmm. I'm like, God speed to you. You know, but it was one of, it was, it was problematic because of the way it was um, edited and put together. Right. And I think people that look at it will probably kind of see that where you mm -hmm. kind of go, why they tell it like that? Mm -hmm. But the one that was before that, Trickster, again, same reason, problematic, because not mm -hmm. edited and, and put together by a native. Mm -hmm. And some of the artwork in it's really like, wow, planes, Indians, everywhere, everywhere, uh -huh. in every story. <laughs> but there's some gems in there, Roy Boney's in that, and his story is, is amazing. Uh -huh. And there's some other ones. So you just kind of go... <sighs> so, so unless we, I think... As Native artists, we put together these anthologies. Mm -hmm. We're not going to see anything that's really representative of who we are. Right. That's always going to be kind of that Hollywood, you know, boom, 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 boom. Right. It's going to be that. So. And you have helped found um, the Indigenous Narratives Collective, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about it and how long it's been in existence? Well, Ink kind of started as this crazy meeting of uh, me and uh, Theo Zoe, who's Las Vegas Paiute, and Jacques Lagrange, 
who's San Carlos Apache, um, at Comic-Con in San Diego. We said, let's have breakfast. So we had breakfast, and we was talking, and like, we need to get together on this. All the other, you know, minority groups, they, mm-hmm. Latinos, Asians, they all have all banded together to, to support each other, and you see that they're making some inroads, and I thought, well, why don't we do it? Mm-hmm. And, and then Jacques said, well, we should do a group comic, and I said, yeah, we should. How are we going to do that? And that's how Lee Francis got involved because he said, I have some money, y'all put it together, and I'll let's put it out there. And we made it as a free issue. Um, and that was really my first assignment of doing an anthology book. Okay. So I was the one who reached out to all the artists that I knew and said, hey, what could you do a page on natives in comics or and or your experience or what you'd like to see. So I got pages from, again, Roy Boney, from Ryan Huna Smith, um, Beth Lapenze. Oh, who else was in that book? Oh my God, I can't. Spider Moccasin, my friend from Portland. <laughs> and and, and uh, yeah, Theo, yeah, Theo Zo, he was in that as well. So yeah, it was good. And, cool. and, and it was like the first time something like this had happened. So we had a representation of, like, this is who we are. Right, right. Yeah. And then you went on and you did the similar job editing, but also contributed to the Native Code Talkers book. Yeah, yeah. Tales of the Mighty Code Talkers. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That was <sighs> Denver Comic Con. That's where it was born. And okay. it, was, it was all Lee Francis's fault because he liked this little tiny image that was on the cover of that group comic that we did. The cover shows a grandfather reading a comic book with his granddaughter, and the book they're reading is Tales of the Mighty Coat Talkers. Okay. That's how it <laughs> happened, and so Lee took that little tiny image and blew it up poster size and put it up at our booth, and I cannot tell you how many people stopped by, where's that book? I want to buy it now. And we're like, ooh, ooh baby, we better make it. Yeah. <laughs> so... And that's kind of how Lee has launched um, Native Realities Press, and we still have um, Ink Comics is still Mm -hmm. kind of contributing to that, and the Indigenous Narrative Collective is still out there. Um, But yeah, that's that's how it all started. Wow, the title came first. The title came first. The promotion came first. Yes. (laughs) You've won an award from First Americans in the Arts for Super Indian. Is that what your award was? No, oh, okay. that was actually for Red Road. For Red Road. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You've won two awards, haven't yeah. you? Uh-huh. First, what was the second one for? Uh, this, well, actually, I think one was for... Um, <clears throat> God. Oh, it was for Please Do Not Touch the Indians. That was an acting Joseph trophy. Dan- it was an acting Yes, award. yeah, Joseph Danderans. Yeah, and then the other one is for the music. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And this year, you received a Kaiser Fellowship. Can you tell Yay. us a little bit about yes. the fellowship and what your um, what you, your project is? Well, I'm really thrilled that I'm in the first Writers Fellowship. This is the first time they offered it to writers, and I said, well, Tulsa, for a year? Hmm. Hmm. So I, and I'd seen Sterling Harjo had a posting on his Facebook about it, and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so I filled out all the paperwork and sent in my ideas, which were to write a play while I was here, and then also work with uh, Evelyn Conley on adapting some of Robert Conley's uh, outlaw Indian outlaw books into a graphic novel, and then continue to work on Super Indian. So I waited, and then yay, I got in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you know they're offering a uh, a living space and a stipend and um, intros to people here in Tulsa to you know with the museums, um, city people just to like let them know that we're here, right. and then just to have a group that lives, writes, and works here. Right. Um, and Evelyn. Uh, it's interesting that you're uh, Robert passed. Was it two years ago? Yeah, three years okay, ago. Three yeah. years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I he he does wonderful work. Yes. How did you happen to? Did she contact you, or had you been thinking about this on your own? I've been thinking about this for a long, long time. I I I'm gonna think back. I think the first time I met Robert and Evelyn was in Telequa. 
at their home, um, and I think it was 1999. Mm -hmm. And I stayed friends with them since then. Wow. I knew both of them really well. <laughs> so I was devastated when he passed as well. But in the meantime, um, I'd been talking to Robert about his work. And he, of course, he, I, he'd already given me his blessing. He said, you do with it whatever you want, because I, I trust your work and I'm excited about seeing this. Of course, now he's gone. He won't mm -hmm. see. But Evelyn and I are working on this together. And um, one of the things that have, has intrigued me about this because there's a, a graphic novel about the, the life of Johnny Cash that was put out by Abrams Books a few years back. And it has this really amazing graphic stark black and white work. Mm -hmm. And that's how I want to approach these novels because I think it would just be black and white. Right. I just want to see that. I just want to see it. Uh -huh. See what happens with it. So Robert and I have been talking about Henry Starr. I, I'm not sure if Henry Starr is going to be in the first Robert Conley present, presents, but um, I, I, I love that Robert was a, a scholar of Shakespeare. We had a lot of great conversations about this play or that play, or why did he do that, or this didn't make any sense. And, you know, he said, to me, that Henry Starr is akin to the story of Richard III. And I'm like, what? Uh -huh. And he told me why he thought this, and I was like, you're right. Oh my gosh, you know, so I am still, I'm still doing all my scholarly research on Richard <laughs> III. I might turn into a play, I don't know, at this point, but um, that's how I'm kind of approaching some of this work, because it's classic storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's classic, classic, and it just happens to be Cherokee Outlaws, which which are my kinfolk, Henry Starr, that, I'm related to him. Right. He's like an uncle or something, you know, it's like, okay, okay, this needs to be told. <laughs> I'm excited to see what comes of it. How um, how is being in this particular environment? Because getting this stipend is a kind of freedom, and yet you've sort of been freelancing on your own. You've really been taking on what what you want to do. Yes. Um, but how is it different being, I guess, in a kind of artist community, doing that thing? I. What I'm noticing the few months that I've been here, the few weeks I've been here, is how supportive everyone is. So it's really nice to have like your on-site cheerleading team <laughs> and also be able to give back to them too. This is like, um, yeah, there's another graphic novelist in, amongst our group, Melanie Gilman, and I'm talking to her about like, well, why don't we do this? Or, you know, I could hook you up with these people and, you know, and all this other kind of thing. So we're well, making that networking, too. networking, yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, you performed your music here at the Tulsa campus and also on our Stillwater campus. Yeah. Did you add any new material? You well, I, you know, the one thing that I did add was the song um, called Oklahoma Home. I'd written it a couple of years back and I'd actually performed it on the campus of OU. <laughs> I didn't even say that. I didn't say it. Anyway, but um, I wanted to sing it here too because mm -hmm. it hadn't been sung up here before just down in Norman right. so I thought you know let me just roll <laughs> it out you know and I, I I was trying to make it a track but it just was sounding so acapella to me I have that it may just stay acapella uh -huh. which is good but it just talks about um, Oklahoma being home to all these different tribes and the things that we do and the places that we go and you know with, with a little powwow singing thrown in there. <laughs> oh, <cool. laughs> what are some other awards or honors we haven't mentioned that you've been especially proud of? Well, you know, I, I'm proud recently of that uh, 2016 Best Book of the Year from uh, Debbie Reese, American Indian in uh, Children's Literature for Code Talkers. Right. I was like, yay! And... Um, Lee Francis's uh, Wordcraft has given me a couple of awards as well. I'm like, yay! You know, Storyteller of the Year and all this kind of like, right. kind of really jazzy <laughs> stuff like that. So. Um, and you spoke in one interview a little bit about how using a com 
computer animation program mm -hmm. for drawing is mm -hmm. to, to draw the comics is a little bit challenging at first. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, I, I, you know, this is what I learned from my Comic Cons, because after I went to that one back in <laughs> 2005, I tried to go back every year because it's not just, oh, I can meet the stars of The Walking Dead. I mean, a lot of people just do, or Game of Thrones, they just do that. Right. But they have these tracks, these panels, where they have the people that actually work on the books talk about the, the guts, you know, the nuts and bolts of like, okay, this is how you draw a page in Photoshop, and this is how you color a page in Photoshop. This is how you letter a page in Photoshop. This is how you sell your book to the press. Here's a whole panel of press from the blogs that'll come in and say, this is how you pitch to us. Oh my gosh, they, they make it so easy if you do those things, you know, ha here's how to make a web comic. Here's wow. how to, you know, you don't have to, like, reinvent the wheel. I say, uh -huh. don't have to reinvent <laughs> the wheel. Um, the panel that I went to about digital drawing was this guy named Brian Haberlin. And Brian Haberlin had said, well, even people like Brian Boland, who was a big, I love Brian Boland. He did this thing called Camelot 3000, which is awesome. You know, King Arthur goes to the year 3000. But <laughs> he, he was an old school guy, and he switched over to digital. I'm like, what? And so he said, this is how you do it. It's Photoshop. You get yourself a um, pressure tablet. I use a Wacom and a, and a stylus. And you can use, with your different brushes, you can make your line art within Photoshop and then color it also within Photoshop. And that, again, another Brian, Brian Miller of Hi-Fi Color for Comics, published a whole book about it. This is how you do it. You, you color on screen, you flat it, then you use light to render your work instead of dark. And, it's, and this is how you translate uh, RGB color to CMYK to get it ready for printing. And then there was another guy, um, Richard Starkings and J.G. Rochelle, who are this company called Comicraft, that, that print and sell fonts. They letter all of the big books. They, that's a whole skill, again, in itself of how to do the lettering. Sure, sure. So I learned from those guys. Mm -hmm. And they were very generous, and, and everybody at the cons pretty much, by and large, are generous with their time at those booths. Because if you come in and, and say, hey, I'm working on this, and, you know, I got a lot of good feedback from people. Really excellent feedback. That, <laughs> and that really helped it to evolve. Right. That is so interesting. How do you think your approach to doing comics has changed since you started? Um, I think more in color um, because there's a lot of things colorists can do to flat line art than rendering a really tight background, a really detailed background. You don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You can use different pops of color and textures with, within Photoshop to create a background that you don't have to spend five hours drawing. Mm -hmm. And it's just stuff like that. That's I've seen my work go from there because it's like I need to get this done. <laughs> <laughs> right, it helps. With yeah. Deadlines. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, do you do any freehand sketching at all? Gosh, still? hardly ever. Mm -hmm. Hardly ever. I, you know, and I may pick up my pen and pencil here on this other project. I'm doing a project right now for a pop culture classroom in Denver, Colorado. They run the Denver Comic Con. I was oh. sent a script for the Ludlow Massacre that's two pages. Ludlow Massacre happened in 1914 was where there was a labor... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, the birth of the labor movement and right. child labor laws. It was a lot of immigrants working in a mine. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do wow. two pages on that. Oh, cool. But I'm going to try a different art technique because this is crazy. I'll talk about it with you guys first. So <laughs> this is my idea, and I, I'm, I've got to pitch it to the author and to the publisher, but I want to draw it like a Superman comic from the 1930s or the 40s because I thought, what if those guys, well, I'm, I'm sure they knew about it, what if they had the opportunity to draw two pages on Ludlow Massacre? What would that artwork look like mm -hmm. in that old style? Mm -hmm. So I'm always educating myself, and I'm going to try it. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, so I'm like going to put it together and see what happens. But it's only two pages, so I'm only committing to two pages. So Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
More research. More research. <laughs> yeah, I just got one of the books today. I'm like, oh, okay, let's see what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> so um, describe your creative process a bit from the time you get an idea. What are your steps? Well, my steps are always my, my favorite. Might depend on the medium, too. Oh, well, no, actually, it, it truly, it does okay. start with the Stephen King, what if? And, I, and like I just explained to you about this artwork for the Ludlow Massacre, what if a guy that from the 1930s drew a comic book mm -hmm. about the Ludlow Massacre? What would it look like? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how I'm approaching the art. Um, for the new play that I wrote, Round Dance, what if there was a native version of the film Marty? Hmm. So that's <laughs> that, that's how it started. Okay. And the same thing with you know Red Road. What if there was a native truck driver? And what uh, you know? Right. And if you know, and if I'm writing a piece, um, and I have to, yet to go look at this, I'll have to send you the link. I wrote a song about Celilo Falls in uh, mm -hmm. Portland and mm -hmm. Portland, Oregon area, because it just always shocks me how our sites have gone underwater. Mm -hmm. Many native sites underwater. And this isn't like a sacred place. And I thought, oh my gosh. But I thought, what if, you know, there was a song about it and what would that sound like? And, and uh, somebody just put up a YouTube video with it because I, I did a recording wow. of it at KWSO in um, Warm Springs, Oregon. And they put the video together and I'm like, I need to go look at that. Because that's new to me, and I, I haven't done that song in years. It's been at least three or four years since I even picked up the guitar and played that one. So. Oh, how cool. Yeah, so it's always a what if. That's how mm -hmm. it starts. Mm -hmm. And then the research, when I particularly love the research part. I, I love libraries. I love books. I love Googling and just seeing what happens and looking at images and going, hey. I mean, all this weekend was my research on Ludlow Massacre because I didn't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So now I know. Mm -hmm. Or like Robert Conley and Richard III, I didn't know. I mean, you see the play and go, yeah, whatever, you know. But really understanding, you know, all the pieces and watching different versions of it and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm always learning. <laughs> and I love it. I, I mean, I, I don't ever want to say, oh, I know that. You know, say, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, I need to learn. That's an artist's job, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking back over um, your career so far, what was a fork in the road for you when you could have gone one way, maybe, and you chose this other? Oh, I think I would even go all the way back to high school because I was doing a theater a class at Patrick Henry High School where I went to high school and um, I just wasn't finding my groove because I was like I always tell people when I lived in the Philippines I didn't know anybody but then by the end of our time there everybody knew me because I'd done all this stage work and they'd see me on stage or with my band and they was like oh I was like a rock star in my world and when I came to San Diego from a school of like you know 500 it was suddenly a, a class just a class of 2,000 people. Uh -huh. I got lost. I got lost. And I thought I was going to have that same success that I'd had then, and it wasn't happening. And I was just crying to my theater teacher, like, what do I have to do? I want to I want to go to New York and be John Belushi, and it's just not <laughs> happening. And he's like, well, you know, maybe you need to go to another school, or maybe you need to do this or that. And he, he just had all kinds of ideas for me. I didn't go to the alternative school like I wanted to. And I thought, well, I know I can do all of these things. Which one is going to get me there first? And I looked around and I looked around and I'd seen bands like uh, U2 and all these other kind of groups. And I said, they're talking about issues. They're doing it with music. I only have two minutes to convince or tell this story. Okay, I have a short attention span. Okay, let's do that. So that's how I went off to music. Okay. First, before plays, before comics, before any of that. Because I said, I have short attention span, I can play a guitar, I can write a song. Boom. <laughs> get my message across. Get my message across. Yeah. yeah. What would you say has been one of the high points of your career so far? Oh, gosh, let's see. Um, I guess probably doing the one-person show of, like, actually showcasing all of that. 
I mean, of course, you didn't see the artwork in that, but um, that was all the stuff and all those voices mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. being able to tell all those little stories about the bingo lady and about the, you know, activists and the, all that stuff and the little kid that loves Star Trek and the little kid that likes the Beatles and the, I don't know the whole frack because I, I lived in Gallup, New Mexico for a long time and now everybody thought I was Navajo. <laughs> in fact, I've been asked many times, are you Navajo? I'm like, no, come on. <laughs> but you spend a lot of time with those people and they just can't help it. <laughs> You got that down. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I miss our res accents. I do. It's funny you go out there now and they don't talk like that anymore. Mm. It makes me sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would you say one of the low points has been of your career so far? Oh, gosh. Let's see. Well, there's been some times, and you know, this is, I don't know if this is just the nature of our community or if this happens everywhere, but there was some, oh God, and I hate to tell on people, but I'll, maybe I'll just leave the name of the artist out, but there was a joint show that was done for the National Indian Gaming Association. While I was doing Red Road, I had just opened Red Road in Los Angeles, and they asked me to come out and do a, a quick solo acoustic show, so I said, oh, okay, all right. So I went out there to Albuquerque and uh, was going to do a show at Is Isleta. Um, big theater, and oh, it was packed out. Everybody was there. And then the artist that went on before me I had seen me previously about two weeks ago. I knew my show, knew what I was going to do. And I think that person felt threatened somehow that I was going to just be more excellent. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the motivation was, but... At the end of that artist's show, that person said, the show's over, thank you for coming, good night. And every, all those 2,000 people in that hall exited. And so when I came on with my program, oh my goodness. I was playing to like maybe 20, 50 people. And then the artist that was after me, oh, she was about to just, I don't know. And she had brought her band in from mm -hmm. West Coast and it was kind of like, why did that person do that to us? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But that's happened. I mean, stuff like that happens where it's, there's mm -hmm. these kind of little jealousies and these mm -hmm. this kind of like, well, you can't, you can't do better than me. I'm the only Indian that can succeed. I am the only Indian in the room, in the world. And I I think those are, that's been to me is kind of the low point where, mm -hmm. where somebody's undercutting somebody else. Mm -hmm. For what, um, just because they feel like they have to be the only one. I've seen that in comics too. I mean, that's happened to me on comics panels with other mm. male artists mm -hmm. where they're like, um, one guy asked me one time at a, in a panel with an audience, looked at me and said, huh, Super Indian, what kind of drugs are you on? I mean, that's the kind, I, God, yeah, okay, so that, yeah, those are the low points. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of stuff where it's these other personalities that just, that's like, I don't know, you know, oh, Rodney King, why can't we get along? But I guess we can't, and sometimes you just have, you have to, you know, like, watch your back. Right, right. And then the people, community that you form within yourself you know, you just gotta, I'm gonna bolster you up because you're good people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that other guy, but you're good people. <laughs> yeah, so there's both the Native community and then there's that element of um, male, female. Oh, gosh, and, yeah. And I, I was wondering because comics are still a very male dominated. Yeah, yeah gosh, yeah. I mean, at the Comic Con, sometimes people have stopped by and said, You did that? How nice. You know, that kind of just mm -hmm. dismissive and I didn't know girls could draw and just whatever, whatever. So, yeah, so that's that's an ongoing ongoing right. fight. But, right. yeah, there's, they're just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need to work on those diplomatic skills. <laughs> I know, always, always. But, you know, that publicity background just... <laughs> <laughs> well, is there anything we've forgotten to talk about that you'd like to add? Or Oh, um, let's see. What else do I want to talk about? Um, I think it's, 
I want to talk about revitalizing the language and putting language into the programs because that was, mm -hmm. I was excited that with co-talkers I was able to do that mm -hmm. and source out um, a Comanche speaker, um, Kiowa, and then also uh, Johnny Daikon and Roy Boney. Um, Johnny fluent in Creek. Mm -hmm. Roy Boney, fluent in Cherokee, and able to put that into their work. So that's something I hope that I can keep doing. And like with the new play that I wrote, there's there's Creek language in it and a Creek hymn because, okay. you know, who hears Creek hymns and plays? I mean, I go, oh, why not? <laughs> a random one too, not like not the Hallelujah. No, everybody knows that one. But <laughs> Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, I'm so looking forward to um, seeing some of these new pieces as they come out. And thank you for your time today, Aragon. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> thank you, OSU.